Uh, well, welcome to Exxon News TV. I'm Michael Sala, and I am here with uh, a, a very special person, Aurora Garcia, who has been living in the Pune area since uh, 1981 and has been a witness to many of the things that have been occurring here um, in terms of geothermal drilling and the history of the Pune geothermal venture. So we're going to talk to Aurora and, and get her um, story about you know how how she began, why she began to be a witness to all of these events surrounding geothermal and and how it all began and she has a, a really unique story and so I'm very glad to have Aurora here. Thank you. Thank you Michael. Thank you. So, so Aurora just tell us how, how it began for you, how you ended up on the big island of Hawaii and how you began to be a witness to the, the beginnings of the geothermal drilling here on the big island. Um, I was asked by family friends to uh, move to Kalapana and take care of their home in 1982 and I remember um, we had no electricity and uh, got our water from the rain. It's just an amazing to be so close with nature. And I, had, I remember having a little radio, a little battery radio and the first time I heard about geothermal, I thought geothermal was a good thing. I thought this is an earth energy. and. Um, I remember hearing on the radio that a helicopter had to fly into Kaha'olea and this was in 1983, this was like a year after I came, and that it was heading directly for a drill rig and it was a geothermal drill rig and that, um, that Pele took the whole rig and that's what we now call Pu'u'o'o and that eruption started in 1983 from geothermal and as long as geothermal's been on this island, it's been erupting. So on this map you have here, yes. uh, can you just kind of like point to uh, where the initial uh, geothermal drilling began and, 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 and how it was overrun soon after by the lava? Um, here's Kaimu Bay and here's an area on um, volcano, people understand is like volcano town. And Kahaolea is, um, was a forested area. Now it says Natural Area Reserve, it was, it was a Campbell Estate land at the time. And after that became overran by lava, the state swapped Baukele Opuna Natural Area Reserve, which was all Ohia forest um, that people hunted and got medicinal plants from, and they swapped that for a geothermal um, drilling area. So this first geothermal got covered in lava. This second geothermal, started, never came to fruition. Uh, there was many protests to this and one was in 1989 and to me I got honored to be able to see a ceremony that I'd never seen before done by Native Hawaiians and they chanted and spoke and I don't understand what they were saying but every time they would speak in each direction the clouds would answer them. And the state had already invested so much money through the what's called the ESSA uh, scientific observation holes to find the steam here. That was paid for by taxpayer money. But when that chanting happened, the steam disappeared. So first geothermal, gone. Second geothermal, gone. And now uh, Puna Geothermal Venture here um, at Pu'u, Punua'ula and Leilani Estates. <laughs> uh, three well, strikes. I just want to go back to, to this one here with yes. uh, Kaha'uela uh, yes. back in 1983. So the drilling began there, the geothermal drilling, yes. and then the lava started flowing yes. out of there, and that became the Pu'o'o vent, yes. which devastated that region yes, by the coast of uh, yes. Kalapana yes. and Kaimu. Yes. Um, yes. And so that all began in 83. Yes, with geothermal drilling. And, and, and were there protests? Were you part of the protests? Did you witness anything? Um, the at that point, I had just gotten here, so I wasn't. I was just a witness that that occurred. Okay. I thought geothermal was a good thing. I thought this is natural energy. Um, in 1988, I purchased land in Lani Puna Gardens. There was a small three megawatt experimental state plant. It stunk like rotten eggs, but I thought that was the only thing wrong with it. I was like, okay, if we're going to get energy, 
not knowing anything about anything, um, I thought geothermal was a good thing and bought land and built a house and raised my family there. But it was, every time it rained, um, it was like the, the steam from the geothermal plant would roll along the ground and we would wake up in the morning with crust all over our eyes to the point we couldn't open our eyes. And that's mm -hmm. when I started realizing, wait, my body's trying to fight something off. Something's not right here. And that was a three megawatt plant. Through all the protests, we got that shut down in, I think it was Labor Day of 89. But it was really a trick because the state had already planned to put a power plant 10 times bigger that they were gonna give a permit in October of that same year to this Israeli corporation format for mm -hmm. Pune Geothermal Venture. Mm -hmm. So it's like they kind of like, okay, we're gonna, this, this, this power plant's making us look bad, but we're gonna give you one 10 times bigger. And, and, and so that was in this area, um, near Leilani Yes, in the lower East Rift Zone, okay. yes. And, and so that, was, that area that uh, Pune Geothermal Venture uh, set up that that plan. Yes. Um, this was what 1991. They, they, they got, got their they got their permit in 1989. Um, Ormat Energy was I think the 51 percent owner of it, and they were to come in and just do the drilling and the mm -hmm. building the plant. And then I think at that time Baltimore Gas and Electric was the 49 percent owner, and they were going to come in and do the operations. They had a blowout in 91. A geothermal blowout. They had a kick out actually. Can you explain what that blowout was? Oh boy. Um, so they drill 24 hours a day, day and night. And it's like sleeping behind um, a diesel bus because they run diesel generators to run the, the drill rigs. It's very noisy, it's very stinky, and what they call fugitive emissions may come out at any time. We would smell leaks, and it got to the point that um, our neighborhood had to set up a 24-hour watch to see what they were doing. Pune Geothermal Venture, ORMAT actually, came to, my, came to me and said, we're going to put a drill rig behind your house. It was about a thousand feet behind my house. It was called KS7. And they said, this will be a re-injection well. This is where they pour all the waste water and toxins into the ground and it'll be perfectly safe and they started drilling and that well blew out below 1500 feet and there was a man on top of that rig and that steam it just shot up it sounds like a 747 just put their nose into the ground and it's just shooting up that man was injured he's not a man anymore put it that way i went over to the ormat um, offices on the other side, you know, quite angry for when you've injured your worker and you told me that was a re-injection well, so either you don't know what you're doing or you just don't give a flying. And this man named V. Rice just laughed in my face. He thought this was the best thing ever to see so much power coming out of the ground and that let me know what type of people I was dealing with at that point. Harry Kim was the mayor. Mm -hmm. He had, I mean, not the mayor, the civil defense. He had to pull him on the side and scold him for being so rude. Mm -hmm. So a blowout is when, so underneath the earth is alive and there's much movement going on and geothermal wants to tap that Pele energy. And she's busy birthing other islands. And when they opened it up, they opened her up, it's kind of like a hemorrhage. That's the best way I could say it, but it's powerful. It's powerful. So in February of 91, they already, they already had a, they called it a kick out because it was smaller, at less than 1,500 feet. It was June when the KS-8 blowout happened. At 5.45, we could see steam coming from that well. And I called him, I'm like, look, during the day, the wind blows on Leilani Estates, and thank goodness most people are working or at school, so they're not getting gassed. But at night, the wind stops and it comes down on us. I was like, what's going on over there? Everything's perfectly fine. And at 11.45, that well blew. And it's like an earthquake that never stops. It just keeps shaking the whole house, and it's loud. 
and I had to make the decision, do I get my family out or do I call 911? And fortunately I had visitors and I said, get my daughter out of here. And I called 911, said it was happening. As we drove out, we could see the steam plume had come up. And don't think steam is like teapot. This is lead, arsenic, mercury, radon, chromium, boron, hydrogen sulfide. It's, it's a toxic soup mm -hmm. that I think people know what each chemical may do to the body, but together, the plume went up and and it it stayed in a shape and then it appeared to cool and then it would just roll maybe oh 20 30 feet above the ground and it was heading right towards Leilani Estates and there's PGV workers out there I'm like you need to be evacuating people you need to be telling civil defense like you're having a blowout and it I don't know how long it took before evacuation was called um, it's very dangerous, it's very scary, it doesn't need to happen. And I know from that blowout incident there was a lot of people suffered health problems, animals died and, um, and there was litigation and a settlement. And There was that, there was that. Um, there was, many people did speak up and then there's many people who are so um, humble and saddened and so I won't say their names but from in all the time I've been there there's been a reoccurring no matter whether it's kick out blowouts or leaks it seems to affect the uterus whether it's of a sheep a cow a horse or a human but I've seen many many animals abort I've heard of and somebody I've known for as long as I've lived here and I won't say her name, but the actual fetus exploded during the blowout. The EPA came out, and of their team that came out, there was water people, there was air people, there was ground people. When they came out, one of the women was pregnant. She wasn't by the time she left. So, this is harmful to the Mother Earth mm -hmm. and to the mothers because we're the same. Um, the state called in experts. And so the state at least did one good thing in calling them in, but they didn't listen to the recommendations. One of the recommendations was, is that the, the proximity of the power plant to the residents is so close that any leak we're gonna get exposed. So what was proposed was for the safety of the residents, um, the EPA had trained us to use Jerome portable H2S monitors. They're probably one of the best H2S monitors there is. They have a data logger, so it picks up everything and you can put it right into a computer. The recommendation was for DOH, PGV, and the community monitors to all have that information downloaded real time for everybody to have access to. And that if maybe I had a child that had asthma, well, I don't, I'm not gonna wait for the 25 parts per billion, maybe three parts per billion. I wanna go take my kid to the beach while you have a leak you need to deal with that's gonna take an hour. The state never put that into place because they would have realized the truth of how often that thing is leaks daily. Every day that is leaking. They, have a, they had a, um, a cylinder filled with charcoal called a sulfatrite. Non-condensable gases, they can't put down in the ground. They won't condense. So they just run them through carbon and they just let it release all day long. Um, all their air monitors, hydrogen sulfide, their air monitors for hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is heavier than air. It acts like water. It acts like invisible water. All the monitors were on hills and the intake valves two feet over 10 foot fences. So they're set up to never catch anything. When I would call PGV to bring out their air monitors, they had the same monitors as me, but they had no data loggers. They had a piece of paper and a pencil so they could write it in. When they would bring their air monitors, they would never walk on the ground, not on the ground, but hold them at ground length. They would put them on the top of the car facing away from the plant. So they never ever wanted, nobody has ever wanted to protect the people of Puna, ever. Right. So they never really did an honest job nope. in, in monitoring the quality of the air, nope. those dangerous gases, nope. hydrogen sulfide and other nope. things. In fact, in fact, 
PGV, I think, was required to do a, like a baseline study, what the air naturally is before they even started. As far as NOAA is considered, um, Cape Kumokahi, the purest air in the world. But what PGV did to monitor the air, they would put monitors at the stop signs in our neighborhood <laughs> along Pohiki Road so that they would pick up the exhaust from the cars at the stop sign and use that as the baseline air status mm -hmm. to pretend like our air was already cool. So trying to distort the, yes. the data. Yes. Just in terms of this, this little um, map here, Yes. where was your home in relationship to PGV? Okay, so point. I'm, um, this is, this is the power plant area. This is Pu'u Honua Ula, and then there's another little Pu'u here. This is Pu'u Honua Ula Road. I used to ride my horse all through here. This is my house right here. It was 2,000 feet from the plant. This is my boundary. Fisher 22. Right on Fisher 22. Yeah, and so, right. you know, if you see, if you actually saw the Fisher line, so this is the weird part. This is when I knew that this is not natural. The Fisher, so this is PGV's, this is PGV's um, well field. The Fisher's line up, literally. On the boundary of on the their well field. field. Now, it is the East Rift. The rift is actually farther this way, and then, well, sorry on my map, but it comes down this way. Because mm -hmm. I've ridden, I've, I mean, these rifts, we could put these whole table and cars in, you know, I and see. it kind of curves around this way, mm -hmm. where the actual, like, rifts, they're giant cracks, they're all in this cattle field. Right, okay. This, all those fissures, they literally line up on their lease mm -hmm. line. Right. And, and they and they and they their lease has it, how many acres is it? Five hundred acres. Five hundred acres. Yes. And and they were developing the well sites in a kind of like what twenty five yeah, acre area. Their plant is primary here. Their well so the plant they say about a forty acre. So this is the old H G B G P A site, the three mm -hmm. megawatt. So their well fields is primarily this areas mm -hmm. around here, I would say. Okay. Um, and you used to just ride your horse up oh, yeah. there and, and they wouldn't stop you? Well, they were. I lived there before them. <laughs> I see. Yeah, so I lived there before them. So I know this whole area. So, okay, all these places, all these where you see um, foliage, mm -hmm. it's usually because there is small pools. There's small holes there. Small little craters. Small craters. Okay. Yeah, this is a larger crater. This is... This is the main crater? This, this is, is the, the one later on we'll talk about yes. specifically. Yes. Okay. Um, but these are also... All these areas that are cleared is pretty much flat area. When... Um, when the uh, experts, the geothermal experts came out and after the 91 blowout, uh, one of them came out afterwards on his own dime just to talk to us because he was like, this is really not a good situation. And we went and took samples behind HGPA because there they used to just pour the water right on the ground. Wherever it touched, it killed everything. Ohia trees, plants, everything. When Puno Geothermal Venture came in, what I started noticing, again, it has something to do with the reproduction. It affects the reproductive systems. I would see plants we call rat tails. So they have a, a slender um, flower stem. And they have tiny blue flowers and they're used for broken bones and stuff. But after PGV started, instead of being single, single stems of flowers, they would morph and grow together. They were mutating. So that was very early on when they came. I was already seeing a mutation of plants that I had mm -hmm. never, I had never seen. Um, so whatever they're, just the chemicals alone, you know, Pelly keeps them underground where they're safe. Right. And if she brings them up, they're burning. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, it's a different chemical. Um, so just to summarize so far, yes. so so basically you were there for when when Puna Geothermal got the license in '89. Yes. There was a blowout. Um, in 91 yes. and then in 93 they begin the formal drilling and energy production. Yes, yes, they actually had been drilling before 91 but then they got stopped. 
and 93 they started again. So I've lived through all the drilling up to nine till 2012. Mm -hmm. um, noisy, stinky releases. Later into their drilling, something changed. And I don't know what they were doing, but it wasn't the same. So what year are we talking about that things changed? I would say about 2010, 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. And about that time, everything shifted. A lot of people were fired. So the people that were in the community, you know, lived here and were born here. They were fired. People that would interact with the community were fired. Um, and so this is around the time that they built a, a new plant? Yeah, the new plant that nobody knows about. Okay, so we'll talk about that in the Maybe. next yes. in the next segment. Yes. Um, so this is just kind of like the preliminary yes. uh, aspect of, of all of this. So, um, so in this kind of history, was there anything in particular you wanted to say about you know, that early period from '91 right through up up until this? New I would say, um, you know, the people in the neighborhoods, and it was much less people at that time. But in the people in the neighborhoods, we spoke up very loudly, and we would speak to the Department of Health. They had monitors sitting in Hilo and would not come out to respond. PGV would tend to do a lot of leaking and nefarious things in the middle of the night when they know that the state workers aren't working. Um, we very well informed the regulatory agencies. I was part of a lawsuit to even make H2S limits. There was not even limits. We have no regulation whatsoever. Realistically, there's no monitoring, or there was no monitoring. Well, I'm saying was because the plant's not running. Um, there's no anybody who understands even how geothermal works within the state or county. Um, they rely on the fox watching the hen house. Mm -hmm. And we have shared all our information with them. And other than um, Harry Kim, when he was civil defense, he was the only one that actually cared. And he still cares, but when he got into a higher position, his hands were tied. He says the truth as best he can. Mm -hmm. So the state and county officials weren't interested in really doing any kind exactly. of serious safety um, exactly. inspections or monitoring exactly. because they just wanted the power generation to continue yes. and, and, and get the royalties. Get the royalties and hoping that it would all expand yes. in the future. Yes. Um, so, so this is all around the time uh, that the, um, the the plant was generating up to 30 megawatts. Um, oh. and, and then there was a plan to expand that and, and they had 14 wells that they had designed for 30 megawatts but then around 2006 they got a, a permit or, or permission to expand to 28 wells and, and increase the power to 60 megawatts. Yeah, they do a lot of things. Um, Ormat does a lot of things, they just do it until they get caught. So in 1989 Ormat Energy Systems got a permit for 30 megawatts. And this is when we're on high alert. We are watching, literally, we have a 24-hour watch set up, you know, when steam comes out. Because we don't understand what's happening and nobody tells us. So it's like we have this puzzle that's turned upside down and occasionally we get a piece and we get a piece turned over. And we're just trying to understand what's happening because nobody has answers for us. The EPA is working with us very closely. At a certain point, before the blowout, they were generating 60 megawatts. Okay, so you have a, you have a, PGV has a contract with Helco for 30 megawatts. Um, when the blowout happened, they violated that permit. Helco didn't, I mean, they got a fine but Ormat actually made money off of that because then they could sell their green credits on the stock market. But who were you planning on selling that other 60 megawatts to? So at that point we were like, wait a minute, there's something else going on. You know, we're, we're concerned with our immediate health and safety, but 
I don't think at that point we grasped what was going on, but we knew there's another level of reality mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. that isn't being said. Right, okay, and we're going to come back to that in the next segment, but uh, essentially there you're talking about the power generation at the PGV wasn't just for feeding into the Big Island's electricity grid, that exactly. there was another purpose for that power yeah. generation. And uh, when we come back for the next segment, Aurora is going to tell us what the real purpose or what she saw, what she witnessed that makes us suspect that the real purpose was something much more uh, sinister than just simply, simply uh, generating power for the Big Island's energy uh, generation or energy uh, electricity needs so so we'll be back shortly for the next segment so thank you aurora thank for, you. for giving us a, a rundown on, of the history of geothermal in um in this area of uh, uh, puna i'm glad somebody's finally listening thank you